that there were some challenges. My my husband lost all of his income, um, and he you know was self-employed, and he fell into the cracks of of all the various uh, schemes that were introduced. And we know that there are three million people in across the United Kingdom who did not receive any of the funding. Uh, from the various governments because of of their particular employment uh, situations. My favorite uh, writer as as a child growing up in India was Enid Blyton, but I didn't understand her racism because I didn't grow up in the UK. We are trans women, like I'm a migrant woman, I'm an Asian woman, it's an adjective, it describes my identity. There is a lot of prejudice and racism uh, towards people of color. Uh, within the LGBTQI community. I'm pleased to present Nudul Wadwa's story. Vadva. I uh, live in Edinburgh and I am the manager of the Fourth Valley Rape Crisis Center. I have worked in the men's violence against women sector for 15 years now and I have worked at, in the rape crisis movement for about five years. I'm currently actually on adoption leave so I have two children and have been married for oh, almost 20 years now. And um, yeah, in my free time, which I have a lot more of these days because I'm not at work, um, since I'm on leave, I tend to, like in my past, I used to dance a lot, uh, but now because houses are very fragile here in Scotland, like I always worry about my neighbors hearing my thumping. So um, I don't dance as much, but I'm certainly a dancer um, and, Otherwise, you know, I'm mostly in my kitchen cooking something up. That's how I spend most of my time. And I've recently joined the board of the Scottish Women's Budget Group, which looks at uh, the role of women in economics and, and how um, modern economics or Scottish economics and more widely uh, UK economics uh, should have women centered in policy making. So the pandemic started at a very interesting time in my life. Um, on my la I was on my last day at work just before I went on adoption leave um, and I had to inform my colleagues that uh, we needed to think about how we were going to support survivors of sexual violence in our center, which essentially meant that we would not be able to see anybody face to face and they had to come up with a plan because I was going uh, to adopt my, my second son. Um, and so in some ways, being uh, having my son placed with me uh, for adoption just the week before lockdown, um, in, you know, helped and saved us from some of the real stresses that a lot of us are feeling around the lockdown. On my last day of work, we had about 50 or almost 60 people, mostly women and, and young people, waiting to be seen. Um, they would have waited for at least six or seven months to be seen by one of my workers. Um, and, and so we, we are, as, as a voluntary sector that does some really transformational work, particularly with those who've experienced trauma. Uh, we are almost always on the breadline, almost always under-resourced. During the lockdown, I did uh, use uh, an LGBTI, LGBT service. It was a trans, a mutual aid uh, uh, service that was set up by, by a number of trans people. And, um, I joined them as a volunteer, and um, as as part of that, I was uh, speaking to to somebody, uh, another trans person, uh, who was 
uh, was in need of uh, some support, but you know, it was a mutual support. We we both got a lot out of our conversation, and and that is the extent to which I I could get involved. Um, but as I said earlier in my introduction, I'm on the board of the Equality Network, so there was. Uh, we, we saw that there was funding made available through the Equality Network for a number of small community groups across Scotland. Um, and so I saw that there was money being given, including to this mutual aid, um, mutual aid group uh, that I, I briefly volunteered with. Um, and that helped. It helped a lot in, in different ways uh, for, for communities to do, whether it was arts, you know, in, in investment in, in LGBT arts online or, or whether it was just actual resources, money to buy uh, computers or access to the internet because everything went online. I, I believe that lockdown exasperated all the problems that we already had uh, in our communities. Now, I can speak for trans people in particular. So one of the things uh, that I noticed uh, or experienced was that the transphobia the trans people have been experiencing in the media and the press from from groups of people uh, online and offline for the last three years um, that did not stop during the pandemic so we were already struggling with this barrage of hate and the assault on our rights that was that is being played out currently particularly more clearly in England um, with with the uh, announcement by the Equalities Minister not to have a uh, reform of the, the Gender Recognition Act uh, by almost by saying that this is not what trans people want um, and you know putting it on us as though this is not important to us. It is important to us amongst many other important things. So we many of us were already struggling with with the macro uh, assault on us and the and the microaggressions to speak to Scotland and uh, you know uh, we, we have our similar challenges with transphobia. Um, I, th I think one of the advantages we have is that our women's sector, the, the organized women's sector, the professional women's sector, um, came out with a, a position statement on GRA reform quite a long time ago, and they have not shifted from that. Um, and I've taken a real leadership on it. And yes, um, the the author uh, did write very transphobic stuff, and it had a huge impact on on many of us, um, and into what is transphobic or not. To me, it was clearly transphobic because it made me feel unsafe. It made me uh, uh, limit the conversations that I had with my child about books. And, and, and arts that, that he engages with and to put a perspective on, on that because, you know, some people would argue that the, that, the, that the art is different from the artist and, you know, um, particularly that, that author, um, you know, significantly influential in the lives of so many people, so many children, so many young people. I have read those books and got my own meaning and entertainment that the state is redefining womanhood, which it clearly is not. And no matter um, how many explanations are given with clear, um, uh, with extreme clarity by so many people, cis and trans people, uh, and trans women in particular. So, well, obviously the, the hijra community in, has existed for a very, very long time. Uh, in India, and and it's really interesting to me. Uh, I'm not a historian, but I, I am interested in history, uh, so I may get this wrong. But uh, one of the first communities that was criminalized by the imperialists uh, through through the legislative systems that they set up uh, were the trans community. So, and then they went on to criminalize other uh, communities in India, like tribes of people, much like uh, gypsy travelers are, are criminalized here, much like trans people are oppressed. So, uh, and in every society where there is a right-wing ideology, an imperialist ideology, 
it is almost always exclusively let's fight the battle first on the bodies of trans people on the lives of trans people and so the hijab community uh, experienced certainly historically a position of of privileged power and and some acceptance certainly within the structures uh, of, of, of of particularly the hindu faith and i would also say the Muslim community, there was a position um, of influence. Um, it was not necessarily a mainstream position, I think, but but we had more power. We were not exactly pariahs. We were not exactly li living in poverty. Um, but but you know, there is an intersection of Hindu right wing uh, ideology in India with with LGBTI rights, and it's an interesting hypocrisy, if you ask me. Because if you if you see the, uh, the 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 nationalist government, let's say the Hindu nationalist government, the BJP, um, that is in power, one can argue that they have done well uh, for for trans rights. But they they passed an extremely regressive, in my view, trans rights bill. Within my social circle, so within the community, so I am part Zoroastrian and part Sindhi. So certainly where. Some of us within our families and communities have come out and been accepted. I think it is a, a protest, um, but in some ways it's also a celebration. It's a celebration of how far we've come, but it is a protest. It is a protest because not all of us have all our rights and we don't have all our rights in everything. For example, uh, gay men can still not give blood. Uh, they can't donate their cornea. What is that about? You know, or uh, the the homophobia in 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 in, in IVF uh, or lesbophobia, things like that. There are still so many areas that we need to reform. And of course, for trans people, we can't just be who we are without the state uh, acting in a patriarchal and paternalistic way towards us. So it is about protest and to continue and. Pride is every day, um, and I think, you know, just reflecting on the pandemic, that I, I feel that it has been one long pride season, uh, full of joy, full of protest um, and campaigning, which will not end because one of the things, having a very intersectional identity, um, I know is that equality is fragile. It takes a mood change. So we are a minority in a minority, um, and and the thing about being a minority, which is what the LGBTQI community is, um, is that um, we are always protesting for inclusion, and and so BME uh, people of color, uh, black, whatever term you know, however you self-identify. Uh, people within the LGBTQI community have similar challenges. Um, I think there is a this idea that if we have people of color or BME people in the room as other LGBTI people, we've achieved inclusion. What we've achieved is diversity. Whether you're being actually inclusive, I think that comes with conversations with the minority amongst you. Uh, so because it is the majority that has to transform and change. So have those conversations. What does it look like in your spaces? Where do, how does it feel to be excluded? What can you do differently? Have those conversations without shame and fear. Um, but it's up to the majority for the future. Um, I, I, as a trans woman, my hope is that, uh, that there is a real transformation in how trans people's position in our society uh, is consolidated that is one of equals and what i mean by that is that we are no longer subject uh, to the very patriarchal process of changing our birth certificates um, it also means that trans healthcare is taken seriously and that people are not waiting years to be seen on the nhs um, it also means that we are no longer and over-educated, under-employed community, much like the minority ethnic community. So there's so much of similarity there. And um, I would like to be the first uh, trans MSP of the Scottish Parliament. 
I would like to say that it is possible to have a happy, successful, peaceful life as a trans woman of color. Um, it is very much your right to be, to have that.